Yeah, so in the last class uh, we did FTCS, FTFS, FTBS, right? We saw that the first two were unconditionally unstable. We saw the third one was conditionally stable, and we sort of quickly did BTCS, which I'll look at again one more time, right? And we saw that BTCS was unconditionally stable. Okay, so that's basically where we are. So backward time central space BTCS, backward time central space. I'll just uh, just to so that you know on apply to a greater than zero. Okay, that's the equation that we are looking at, and the stencil. Just to be clear, the stencil looks like that. Okay, so this would be delta t, that would be delta x, and we decided to call the new time level q plus one, staying consistent with what we are doing before. So this is p q plus one. I'll just go through it quickly. Okay, that's fine. Because p plus one q plus one, p minus one q plus one, p q. Okay, and the difference between what we did FTCS and so on and this <coughs> is that the equation is being now represented at the time level q plus 1, that is the difference. Okay. Please remember you have, to, you have to keep that in mind. After a point once you are starting to do these difference discretization and different schemes, it is easy to forget where you are representing the differential equation. So the differential equation is being represented at the point p q plus 1. Okay. So, then it is straightforward as I had indicated do u do t is u p q plus 1 minus u p q divided by delta t do u do x is u p plus 1 q plus 1 minus u p minus 1 q plus 1 divided by 2 delta x. Okay, substituting back into our differential equation gives us u p plus one q plus one, or maybe I don't skip a step here. Full point. So substituting back, and what we are going to do is we are going to keep all the new time level q plus one on the left hand side of the equation, and everything else is going to go on to the right hand side. So I get the u p plus 1 p q plus 1 okay, plus an a delta t by delta x or 2 delta x u p plus 1 q plus 1 minus u p minus 1 q plus 1 equals u p q. And again we identify this oops, sorry wrong one as sigma. So we have gone through we have gone through the stability analysis for this and we have shown that it is unconditionally stable stable for all sigma because the gain mod g or mod g squared, I am not going to go through the whole thing, I just wanted to get to this point. Okay, mod g squared was 1 over 1 plus sigma squared sin squared theta, right and we wanted that to be less than 1, is that fine? Okay, at theta equals 0, it is 1 but otherwise it is strictly less than 1, is that fine? Okay, and as always, I'm not really concerned about that DC component right now. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah. This is for one particular n, right? This g, or we can say this is like some g n. No, this is this is like uh, yeah. It should be. It should have. A, it should be a g n. This is. Say that sigma mod of g n square. 
should be less than one right because uh, we can't just take just one wave number and i mean take a, we have to take no, the no, general the system of equations is linear the system of equations is linear so essentially we are looking at the uh, it's like saying that if you say sigma f equals 0 it's like saying does the x component grow so the system of equations is linear right so you can just look at you can look at the individual components you can look at the individual components finite dimensional vector space so just just having each component uh, being finite doesn't necessarily mean the norm of the whole vector is finite well no there you have see there is a there is a there is an issue here we are just basically saying that you know there are more serious issues there right uh, i've just basically if you're going to now go to the fact that it's an infinite dimensional vector space the original space is an infinite because we are not gone to the limit right this is definitely finite dimensional because i can't represent anything over a certain largest wave number so in this case for the numerical scheme that question doesn't mean it does, it's not an issue right i'm going to take 10 grid 10 grid points i know 5 is the largest wave number i take 10 intervals 5 is the largest wave number i can represent so that's it i mean it's 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 finished with that however if you are talking there are other issues that if you are talking about about it from an analysis point of view there are even you know like uh, if i say take the sin theta component if you actually go through the process you will see that you will be trading summations infinite sums with there are two limit two infinite processes that you will be exchanging so then the issue of uniform convergence and so on all those all those also become issues so even before you get to this there is a, there are other issues that you have to hand am i making sense okay right so if you if you want to look at it from a mathematical analysis point of view there is a problem there which i am not paying i am not looking i am not paying attention to any of that right because i am not going i am never going to go to that infinite process right right so the really you will you will not hear me uh, typically talk, if i say uniform convergence yes when i'm talking about sor i'll say something about oh it's not uniform convergence it isn't it interesting right but in this case you want uniform convergence if you are actually going to an infinite sum and you are going to say that i'm going to exchange the differentiation right if you substitute if you substitute for u you expand u in terms of fourier series right you expand u in terms of fourier series and you want to substitute it into the derivative you expand u in terms of a fourier series and you want to substitute it here if i want to trade i want to exchange the derivative with the infinite sum then there are certain properties that i need uniform convergence being one critical property that i need okay right but we are not going to do that but it is an important consideration i am not i am not i am not saying it's not it's an important consideration but we are sort of in a finite dimensional space okay so in that sense it doesn't matter fine okay and there is this has a consequence to something that i'm going to say later in class this has a consequence but we are in a finite dimensional space is that fine okay right so in this case and like we always do in like we always do in mathematics or in our, any any of our mathematical physics or right deriving or governing equation the wave number was chosen arbitrarily that is we are just basically saying for an arbitrary wave number n for an arbitrary wave number n what does this do and then we ask is there any particular wave number for which it's very bad right so and it turns out that there is no sigma see that's basically what it because the n is uh what do you call it there is the n is embedded in here there is no sigma for which this thing is going to blow up there is no combination of parameters physical parameters that we have as a choice right either delta x delta t or of course given the speed of propagation for which this is going to any of the wave numbers will diverge okay is that fine that's basically what we are showing so it is it is unconditionally stable okay now we've got that you know so in fact yesterday i said yeah great we we finally got we finally got something that is unconditionally stable because it's a bit disappointing you do ftcs you expect it to work and it didn't work right so it, it's very nice that it's unconditionally stable but at what price what is the price if i look at ftcs and i look at this this equation i have sort of messed it up so i can rewrite it so if i say that uh now i'm going to write it in a slightly different form so that we get it
okay I have written it in this form so that you can see that this actually forms entries in a tri diagonal matrix the diagonal term is u p q plus 1 the sub diagonal is p minus 1 the super diagonal is p plus 1 okay and when you come to the again if you take the right this is at this is at time level q plus 1 so when you come to when you come to this point clearly you need the boundary condition there okay that will go over to the right hand side and when you come to that point when you come to computing the value p, p is this value then you need p plus 1 you need p plus 1 okay so this is a boundary condition that is required because of our numerical scheme choice of numerical scheme I chose central difference because I wanted more accuracy so we need to do something here there is a boundary condition that needs to speci be specified at the right hand side which is not required as part of the either the physics or the mathematics okay more we get a system of equations okay so you may say what is the big deal so you get a system of equations but if you solve the system of equations what do you get you have taken one time step I want you to understand this you solve the system of equations you have taken one time step now you get ready to take the second time step and you have a whole system of equations again okay as it turns out because because these uh, coefficients are constant it is not a non-linear equation right this is a this is a setup where something like LU decomposition will do well right so you pre decompose then now you are left with only forward substitutions and back substitutions okay so this is this is a situation where a scheme like LU decomposition works well okay you do some work any work that you do uh, beforehand on the matrix is work that you do not have to do at a later date right because the matrix has not changed as long as it depends on does not depend on these variables that is one way to do it it is a direct method direct methods have their own problems when the matrices grow very large okay because if you do look at the process of forward substitution and backward substitution you will see that the last quantity that you determine is based on a series of computations that you have made on the previous n minus 1 quantities okay and therefore it is it is prone to error if you take if you if you are solving a thousand by thousand system and you have one million unknowns or in three dimensions you are solving right a hundred by hundred by hundred system which is still one million unknowns then the last quantity that you calculate the one millionth quantity that you calculate comes as a consequence of calculating all the previous nine nine hundred ninety nine you know ninety nine lakh whatever 999,000 am I making sense right so it is it is uh, it is it is too much right so the, the error the round off error tends to accumulate so for that reason I typically do not use direct methods this is a personal opinion now I typically do not use direct methods for matrices that are if they are banded matrices like this maybe up to about 1000 by 1000 right and if they are not if it is a dense matrix maybe about 200 by 200 this is a personal opinion you understand what I am saying if you give me a matrix when I say dense matrix all the entries essentially all the entries are non-zero right you are doing panel method or something of that sort okay 200 by 200 that is about the largest otherwise I, I immediately switch to iterative schemes which is why I started you off on Gauss Seidel okay if it is a sparse matrix like this maybe I will go up to about 1000 by 1000 thousand unknowns but once it goes beyond that I will always go to an iterative scheme I may use this LU decomposition as an initial guess fine in this case however if you are wondering why the heck is this guy harping so much about in this case however with iterative schemes there is an advantage what is a good guess what is a good guess for uh, UPQ plus 1 UPQ right you have a good guess if your delta T is reasonable size right you have a good guess already you have UPQ as an initial guess am I making sense so you already have something with which you can start right so it may not be that bad it may not be but the fact of the matter is that you have to solve a system of equations and when you are done solving it you have taken only one time step I want you to remember that so there may be some effort that has to be put in to solve this other than just the schemes that I have told you fine there are ways by which you can accelerate these schemes I am not going to spend time on that there are ways by, ways by which so this this gives you a system of equations that is the key 
point that I want to make is this gives you a system of equations and because these equations appear together these expressions these terms appear the, the quantities that you want appear together uh, packed together it is called an implicit method fine it is called an implicit scheme. I will say a little more about implicit schemes, explicit schemes as we go along you will see that I uh, will illustrate various kinds of situations that occur. So this is called an implicit scheme because you get a system of equations where the unknowns are tied together in a linear fashion and you cannot you have to solve a system of equations to get it okay. It is the reason why right in the beginning I said some of the mathematics that you want to learn implicit function theorem is one so it will tell you when you can in the case of a linear system of course the system just has to be invertible right but uh, implicit function theorem will tell you in general if you have an implicit expression when can you invert it okay. Implicit scheme as opposed to I will just write it just for the sake of uh, this is FTCS so this is BTCS this is FTCS. This is an explicit scheme. Explicit because I have the expression that I want explicitly occurring on the left hand side, no further work need to be done. Okay, fine. Are there questions? Okay, so now we get to this point that we are talking about earlier. So I have 10 intervals, we have already shown that the largest wave number that we can represent is basically 5, right? Okay. So bear that in mind. There is so if I if I have something that has, if I have sin ten x, we've already seen in the demo that sin ten x, right? Sin twenty x, sin all all of these sin fifteen x, all of them are basically going to look the same. You have only ten grid, ten eleven grid points on which you are sampling the function. Okay. So bearing that bearing that point in mind, I ask the question now. These equations approximate the original wave equation, linear wave equation. I go through the effort of solving the system of equations and I end up with a solution. The solution is an approximation to the solution to that equation that we want to solve, okay. So I will, I am going to ask an ill posed question basically. To what equation is it an exact solution? The solution that I am calculating here is an approximate solution to the problem that I am trying to solve. To what problem is it the exact solution? Put another way, what is the problem that we are solving? I want to solve the linear wave equation, but I am making an approximation. I am solving some other equation actually. When I say I am making an approximation, so I am sort of turning around and saying, well, I have this u, I have this function, right? And if this if this function is if this solution this approximate solution is close to the exact solution, then I must be solving a problem that is close to the exact so exact problem. I must solve, be solving a differential equation that is close to the exact differential equation. What is that equation? Does that make sense? Does the question make sense? I say it is ill posed because I just told you if I have only 11 grid points, I have these values at 11 grid points. We already know that there are so many an infinity of functions that it represents. Okay, but though it is ill posed, it is still a worthy question to ask because the answer is interesting. Okay, the answer is interesting. Am I making is that clear? Right. So the question we are asking is I have an approximate solution to the equation that I want to solve. To what equation is it the exact solution? We want that equation. Okay, is that fine? Right. So what we do is we do a very simple thing, maybe I will start off. Since I have FTCS here, I will start off with FTCS, right? And we will go back to our friend Taylor series. We will use Taylor series, expand these about the point FTCS. We were representing the equation at the point PQ, that is important, okay? It is this is what I say you have to constantly remind yourself. So, we are in FTCS, we are representing the equation at the point PQ. So we will expand Taylor series always is uh, where are we are representing the function about which point are we expanding right. So we are going to expand about the point PQ okay. So let us do UPQ plus 1. So UPQ plus 1 
is u p q plus do u do t times delta t plus do squared u do t squared times delta t squared by 2 factorial do cube u do t cube delta t cube by 3 factorial how far do we want to go maybe we will add one more is that fine and this supposedly equals u p q which is the first term minus sigma by 2 this is going to get a little messy u p plus 1 q so this is u p q plus do u do x delta x plus do squared u do x squared delta x squared by 2 plus do cubed u do x cubed delta x cubed by 3 factorial plus the fourth derivative minus this part is okay minus u p q minus minus plus be careful there is a minus sign here p minus 1 so it is minus delta x okay plus do u do x delta x minus do squared u do x squared delta x squared by 2 plus do cubed u do x cubed delta x cubed by 3 minus the fourth derivative. a mess but lots of things will cancel well enough things will cancel not lots of things will cancel but enough things will cancel first of all the upq goes away the second derivative goes away you may ask why are you doing this we did it for uh, right we did it when we are doing the derivation of the different scheme but anyway humor me fourth derivative goes away is that fine anything else the u p q here goes away okay i think that's it we are stuck we are we, we can't do anything else here so i'll rewrite that that tells me that right i'll rewrite that and uh, if i divide through by delta t it gives me a do u do t plus do squared u do t squared delta t by 2 do cubed u do t cubed delta t squared by 3 factorial do to the fourth u do t to the fourth delta t cubed by 4 factorial equals minus a do u do x that is the first term there are two of them so minus a do u do x okay then what else do we have minus 
minus sigma by 2 minus sigma by 2 delta x cubed 2 will go away because you will get 2 of these by 3 factorial times delta t dou cubed u by dou x cubed you can please check to make sure there, there are no issues and I do not think we have right the fourth derivative goes away there are no other there are higher order terms so I should say plus dot 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 right everyone. So I can easily see that I have a dou u dou t minus a dou u dou x I mean you should expect that I am going to get that. What do I do with the time derivatives? You know I would really like to have this as because we have already seen I mean we have gone to forward time or backward time right because we higher derivatives in time are clearly not that easy to handle okay. So as far as possible we want to retain this as a first derivative in time I do not really want I do not like these higher derivatives in time for that reason. Spatial derivatives at a given time level I have right spatial derivative I, I can I know I am comfortable with that at a given time level I can evaluate spatial derivatives. Right, oh, oh, whatever order derivative that you want, that is of what right second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative, no problem. Temporal derivatives, it's a bit shaky because when I start off, I only have one time level at which the initial data. Right, so somehow I don't want this. So what I propose to do is, I propose to replace this derivative, time derivative, by a space derivative. Right, so the game that we play is this. So if you say that do u do t equals minus a do u do x this is our differential equation okay then do squared u do t squared equals minus a do squared u do t do x equals minus or plus a squared dou squared by dou x squared of u is that okay yes at this point someone should have a complaint does anybody have a complaint I am proposing to replace the second derivatives with this okay I am proposing to replace the second time derivative with this second spatial derivative fine okay. So if I go to dou cubed u dou t cubed which is the time derivative of this that should give me fine okay see if you if you do not if you ignore that u this basically says that dou by dou t is minus a dou by dou x it is essentially what it is saying right dou by dou t is minus a dou by dou x fine okay. So fourth derivative would be something similar fourth derivative fourth derivative will be something similar fourth derivative would be okay so we end up actually end up with something like this so i'm proposing to substitute this here see okay i'll tell you the complaint that you could have the actual complaint that you can have is this equation what is this equation this is the equation that we are actually solving when you do ftcs when you do ftcs right when you use ftcs ftcs in this case happens to be unstable but if you were to say or ftbs or whatever when you are trying to solve using FTCS right you are getting you are trying to get an approximate solution to the original equation you are getting an exact solution to this equation this is the equation that you are actually solving okay this is the equation so this is since this equation dou u dou t equals minus a dou u dou it looks very similar to the original equation right this is called the modified equation this equation is called the modified equation. But there is a point here 
the point is if I am going to substitute for the derivative time derivative for the second derivative to eliminate the terms there, should I not use the modified equation instead of the original equation? You understand what I am saying? Yeah. If this is the modified equation, this is the equation that I am actually solving, if I am going to make the substitution, should I not use the modified equation to do it instead of the original equation? The answer is yes, you should, right. I am going to use the original equation for two reasons. One, doing this and eliminating the terms is a lot more difficult, right. So that uh, if you want you can look it up when my book comes out you can look at the book but whatever you know, when it when it you can look at you can look it up you can work it work through it so you because the trouble is you will get a lot of mixed derivatives it is a very messy equation right so you can make the decision that you will only keep terms up to the fourth derivative and every time you differentiate this you know that for instance this term will go away once you differentiate with respect to time this will become a fifth derivative you can drop it right it is you can there are things that you can do to simplify but still using this equation is a messy messy process okay and there is a second issue that will become clear later that using this actually by itself has its has a certain advantage okay you will see you will see what i mean when i when i will explain that when i come to the end using this by itself has an advantage so instead of using the modified equation to eliminate the time derivative terms which is what you should technically do i'm going to use the original equation to eliminate the right for those terms am i making sense is that okay simply because a on the blackboard it is easier to do right b because that equation that you get is still a useful equation are there any questions yeah we can write this taylor series expansion only if the function is analytic right but here we I mean yeah no we have a no. we have a uh, we have an issue that is uh, how many terms of the taylor series let's see where you get to that uh, you cannot in a sense get to even any of our finite differences you understand or the differential original differential equation you, you have to ask the question right if the Euler equations support shocks discontinuities then how did you write so that we that goes into a different realm right that goes to a slightly different realm so maybe I do, we do not we do not we, we will assume that we can do this and get away with it in fact even for the Euler equations if you do quasi 1D flow also you can you will get shocks Right. We will look at this, you will get shocks and we will use finite difference methods and we will use a differential equation representation to actually go through and solve, okay, right. So then the issue is why does it work, how does, okay, the, the, so that theory is something that uh, that is sort of outside the scope of this course, fine, right. Because if you get to, if you get to, if you look at it from a point of view of theory of differential, the way I usually handle it is I always go with integral equations. I do not usually solve them in the differential equation form, right. But uh, even otherwise, there is a whole theory of uh, weak solutions and so on, right. So when we say a solution, we are saying a solution is something that you can substitute into the original differential equation to verify whether it satisfies that equation or not. But if the solution has a discontinuity, how do you substitute it into a differential equation, okay. So you have to do something to weaken that differential equation. So that is a whole, there is a whole mathematical machinery that goes with it. So we are not really going to maybe at the end of the semester if we have time we will get to it okay right so at, the, at this point we will just leave it at this and basically say that uh, you know so I will sort of repeat something I said right in the beginning that I can take as many derivatives as I want right right okay I can take as many derivatives as I want and typically I will stick to fourth right okay so I will I will substitute this back there and we will see what we get we will see what we get let me So I get my original differential equation dou u dou t minus uh, plus a dou u dou x equals and what does it equal? Is there a second derivative term? A minus a delta t by 2 dou squared u by dou x squared okay 
then what else do we get? Do I have a third derivative term? A minus and that is a plus. So I get a a cubed delta t squared by 3 factorial I think I got that right minus sigma delta x cube by delta t and then there is a fourth derivative term a minus a to the fourth delta t by 4 factorial is that fine okay you can you can check whether i have in fact in this case so this is something that uh, I prefer to do for my modified equation. In this case, you can actually factor out a delta x cube, right? This will turn out to be a. You will get. You will get. You can write this expression in terms of sigmas in the parenthesis. Did I did I miss a sign somewhere? The first one is minus a squared. A squared. A squared delta. Okay, that's fine. And there are there are, right? There are an infinite such number of terms. We are not going to look at. As I said, I'm not really bothered, right? We may be even able to write a, a general expression after looking at this for the even terms and the odd terms. If you write this in terms of sigma, that pattern may become more obvious. But it doesn't matter. It's not. It's material for me right now. What matters to me right now? What matters to me right now? Right? What matters to me right now is that we have this modified equation okay modified equation i have it in terms of i have it in terms of the original expression equals all the extra terms and we ask the question what happens when delta t and delta x go to zero okay and again when you have two such things going to zero there is always an issue as to with whether something is going fast so we want delta t and delta x going to zero in a similar fashion okay delta x and delta t go to 0 all of these individual terms go to 0 the right hand side all the terms go to 0 is that fine everyone as delta x and delta t go to 0 in a comparable fashion right in a comparable fashion basically that I am, I am saying that the ratio of delta x and delta t does not change for instance in a comparable fashion as delta x and delta t go to 0 this equation the modified equation goes to the original equation as this this goes to this becomes do u do t plus a do u do x equals 0 the modified equation goes to the original equation okay. So, as the number of points that you are using to represent the solution increases which is what delta x going to 0 means and as the time steps that you take in evaluating it go to 0 right. So, as your representation gets more and more accurate as your representation gets more and more accurate the modified equation goes to the original equation which is a good thing I mean we are happy that that happens this property is called consistency. scheme is said to be consistent. So, you say I took a differential equation I discretize the equation I use Taylor series in this case I discretize the equation I end up with a modified equation if in the limit my delta axis say when I did the finite difference scheme I said I am not going with the infinite process if in the limit of doing the if in the limit of doing the infinite process I actually let delta x and delta t go to 0 if my discrete equation goes to the original equation the scheme is said to be consistent okay you may be under the impression you can say wait a minute we substituted 
finite difference method, individual derivatives uh, the definitions work, how can you come up with a scheme that is inconsistent, right? it is possible as someone who has, who has invented schemes that are inconsistent, it is actually possible, terms can cancel, you put them together there are terms that can cancel and you can be left with it, you can be left with a term that just refuses to go to 0, do you understand, right. So it is possible for you to invent a scheme, it is possible for you to invent a scheme that is inconsistent, right and you should, you should suspect that I mean we invented a scheme which would not work, FTCS which who is modified which is consistent, it is consistent and it would not work, right, it is possible actually for you to invent a scheme which is inconsistent, it is possible. So this consistency is very important, okay. So as delta x and delta t go to 0, modified equation goes to the original equation, the scheme is said to be consistent. As delta x and delta t go to 0, if u, I will write h where delta x, delta t are like h, they are like h, I am going back to that, remember the notation where I put a superscript h means that it is a, it is a discrete solution. If in the limit h going to 0, u of h goes to u, then we have convergence, am I making sense? As h goes to 0, our candidate solution, approximate solution converges to the exact solution, our solution converges to the exact solution. I do not want you to get this confused with our iterations converging, that is a different convergence, that is a sequence of solutions that are being generated which converge. This is a sequence of solutions with different h's with different grid sizes and as I change the grid sizes it converges, am I making sense? So you have consistency, you have convergence, we have stability of the scheme, there are three things that are that are there, okay and there is a famous theorem you can go look it up called the Lax equivalence theorem which basically says if you have two of them you have the third, okay. Consistency, convergence, stability, these are the three properties for the scheme that we have seen so far. Okay. And they tell us how is our scheme going to behave, they tell us if you generate a solution, are you generating, does the solution converge to the original, right, does it converge to a solution, does the approximate solution converge to a solution, does the equation that you are solving for that scheme, does the equation converge to the actual equation, okay. We are to a large extent we are satisfied with this, okay, but if you are doing mathematics formally you would want to know not just that the u's converge, you would also want to know that the derivatives converge, that dou u dou x converges and dou t dou x also converges, right, right. We are as engineers we are a little more coarse, we say okay u converges, we are very happy, right and when you are doing your actual calculations, you, once you have a scheme you say well somebody has looked at consistency, convergence, stability and all that and you tend to just take, take the u for what it is, right, but this is an issue, okay, is that fine, consistency. Convergence, please remember in this context convergence what it means, okay. As h goes to 0, u h goes to the actual solution and of course we have seen stability, fine. That is all very nice, something else comes out of this, something else comes out of this. We had a form of a solution for this equation, it looks like if you do this you get these extra terms, if you, if, you, if you look at the modified equation you get these extra terms on the right hand side. Is there a way for us to infer an analytic solution, we had an analytic solution, a proposed analytic solution for this in terms of Fourier series and so on, is there a way for us to get an analytic solution with something on the right hand side, am I making sense, is it possible for us somehow to figure out a way that we say. I have this, I know the solution to this, if I add something to the right hand side, is it possible for me to get a solution, is that fine, okay. So we can, I will just basically start us off on that, what we are going to do is, this, these, these are called semi inverse techniques in the sense that we are going to guess the form of a solution and try to find some disposable coefficient that we have thrown in, so that it becomes a solution, right. Because we already know 
that for dou u dou t plus a dou u dou x equals 0, we already know a solution of the form a n exponent, I am writing only one, one term, I am writing only u n, i n 2 pi, we will draw the drop the 2 pi and l, okay, we will we'll, we'll just for now if l is 2 pi it takes care of that, right, we will we'll drop the i n x minus a t, right, just to keep, just keep the chalk dust to a minimum, we will drop the 2 pi and l, we will just assume l is 2 pi. We know that if we substitute this in there it works, okay. So if instead of being 0, what if it is pick one of those terms, what if it is I choose mu 2 as a coefficient dou squared u dou x squared, what if it have have that form, okay, fine. Can we guess a solution for it? What did Laplace say? This looks like uh, second derivative is like you know, so Laplace was smoothing. I would expect, I would expect some kind of, and from our physical intuition, which is why to trigger that intuition I called it mu, right, like viscosity. I would expect that it's a, it is a, it's right. So we we'll, anyway we have oscillation. We'll see if something can happen. See there are different ways by which we can argue this. Remember we are we are only trying this out. We are only trying this out, right? That is basically it. If it does not work, it does not work. We are only trying this out. So, I would say that I throw in an extra parameter b and, and look at the candidate solution u. I mean, I should write n, but I am not going to write n, u sub n, right, of that form. And ask the question if I substitute this into this equation, I say consider a solution. See, this is how you do it now. Now that we have guessed this, we say consider a solution of this form substitute that in there and see if you can actually get a value for b and does that value mean anything, is that fine, okay. So what is dou u dou t, a n exponent i n x minus a t you want to do it in one shot or you want to split it e power b t times the derivative of the thing right and basically using chain rule minus i n a plus b is that okay? This is the derivative of time minus i n a plus b. What is dou u dou x? Instead of writing out the whole thing, I will just write it as u now that we know it is u, u times i n, okay. Substitute it back there. So you get u times minus i n a plus b t. Oh, sorry, I need one more. What is dou squared u dou x squared? Right. The u of course cancels, the i n a cancels with the i n a, I have a stake there, it is not a b. So b is that fine everyone, 
okay this is this is this is called a semi inverse method you sort of guess the form you have a few disposable coefficients you substitute it and see if you can fit the coefficient so that it turns out to be the answer okay is that fine we will come back to this we will come back it is possible now we know that it is possible what does this mean how does it what does it mean for FTCS what does it mean for FTBS can we explain what we got is what we are going to look at okay in the next class fine okay thank you.